We thank you for joining us today during this webinar. Today, our presenters, Ola Tunde and Dev, will be talking to you about our PKI nuts and bolts. They are also going to be helped by on the panel members from both the IT team and the training team, who will be moderating this session, providing technical support and taking questions from the chat and during the Q&A section. Before starting, here are some house rules for the success of this webinar. All the controls are at the bottom of your screen. For any questions related to the webinar, please use the Q&A section. For all other needs, technical problems, slides, sound, please use the chat section. At the end of this webinar, we will be sending you a survey. This will help us improve our future presentation so that we bring a better out of it. So please do not forget to fill it out. We look forward to a fruitful and enjoyable, but above all, an interactive exchange. So uh, if uh, I would like to ask you, if you hear us, please let us know in the chat section where you are coming from. So over to you, Ola. Thank you very much for the introduction, Emma. So, uh, let me reintroduce myself again. My name is uh, Ola Tunde Awobuluyi. I'm a trainer here with the Capacity Building at Afrinic. And uh, my colleague, Dave Jr. will be supporting me today. He's a senior IP number resource analyst. He'll be supporting me during this webinar session. So let's get into it. So the agenda for today's webinar, first thing we'll be looking at today is at the, it's looking at BGP, a very, very high level of, and then looking at the limits, the vulnerabilities of BGP. Then my colleague Dave will talk to you about the limitations or why the internet routing registry is not sufficient alone. And then we're going to spend a, you know, quite a lot of time here looking at how RPKI makes BGP more secure. After all, the title of the webinar is RPKI Nuts and Bolts. A bolt. So we're going to get our hands dirty here a bit. And then we're going to look at how, Dave is going to show you how to create uh, a ROAR, it's an Afrinic member. And then after this, we will have a questions and answers session where we can interact with us. So let's get down to business then. So BGP or interdomain routing. So the internet, the, the network of networks comprises of different autonomous systems, which are, you know, uh, networks under a particular administrative control. Uh, within these ASCs, you use uh, IGPs, in, uh, interior gateway routing protocols like OSPF or ISIS to move traffic around within it. But to move traffic between uh, autonomous systems, we use uh, uh, eBGPs as exterior gateway protocol. And the only one we have right now is uh, BGP. And it's the de facto routing protocol we use on the internet. So um, exchange of routing information between autonomous systems with BGP is done by trust, basically. Now, but why is BGP the, uh, the de facto routing protocol used to move uh, traffic between autonomous systems? Well, first of all, uh, Apart from its uh, IGP counterparts like OSPF, it has a rich set of path attributes, which helps it, which helps uh, administrators to be able to define uh, fine-grained routing policies. You cannot do with something like EIGRP or OSPF. Another another uh, feature of BGP that allows this again is that it has batch updates instead of periodic, like its IGP counterparts. So. Uh, because of this, BGP can scale across very large networks. Like you can tell, the internet is across the world. And then finally, it has a multi-protocol support for different address families. And this also makes it easy to extend. So that's all fine and dandy. BGP is the de facto routing protocol used on the internet. But BGP does have its vulnerabilities. Now, there are quite a few of them, or quite a number of them, but we are going to focus mainly on a particular one today, but still we're going to highlight a few of them so you get the idea. So one of the first one is TCP related. Now BGP uh, runs on TCP port 179, hence 
it is susceptible to TCP related attacks. So whether it's TCP SYN, TCP uh, SYN ARC, ARC, an attacker can disrupt session establishment between two BGP speakers by just spoofing a particular packet and the appropriate sequence number. So, and even after your TCP uh, session has been established, uh, you can still, BGP is still vulnerable because you can still spoof the BGP messages, the actual BGP messages. The second one we'll look at briefly is route leaks. Now route leaks, is a, it's, it, it's a vulnerability in a way where you have a, you, a route is propagated beyond the scope in which it was intended. Now, usually this usually happens between um, a multi-homed uh, uh, network who isn't a transit provider, not an ISP, but it's connected to two transit providers and it might leak the route from one transit provider to the other one. Now that's, that's harmless, but the return traffic, the offending AS might not have the capacity to route that or handle it and they might just be dropping it. So they create a black hole in, in, indirectly. So that's for route leaks. Now the third one is uh, AS, path, uh, AS path spoofing, where you basically you you the the AS path attribute in the BGP update is altered so that uh, the attacker can move allow traffic to go through a particular AS maybe for snooping or whatever reason. But the main one we want to focus on today is prefix hijacking. Uh, so what is prefix BGP prefix hijacking? But before we do that. Uh, we have uh, some of the latest BGP hijack news headlines. You can scan this if you have, um, if you have a phone with a QR code. Uh, basically, this will lead you to BGP stream where you see reports of daily hijacks. And as at the time we started this webinar, uh, there, was a, there was a report about the possible hijack and the offending AS was AS218457. All right, you can check that maybe after the webinar and see more updates on, the, on that. So what is BGP prefix hijacking? So basically, like it says here, an, an authorized, unauthorized announcement or origination of a route prefix. That's all words. How do we see? Let's see, what, let's see how that works. So we have this uh, network topology. You, you have the uh, AS is A to E and a pirate AS. Now the AS is of interest are pirate D and A. Now A is the you know, good green AS and they can they announce a prefix to D, for example, or announce a prefix, the right prefix, the uh, IPv6 prefix. Now, you know, in the BGP table that, you know, with the AS path that uh, prefix is installed, that, okay, you can get to A through CB. Now, it's also possible the pirate AS can announce that same prefix. They can do that. BGP will allow them to do it. Nobody will stop them. And this goes also into the BGP routing table, or BGP table, sorry. Now, all things being equal in the BGP uh, route selection process or path selection process in the BGP table, this, the one from the uh, pirate AS will be uh, selected because it has a short, shorter AS path. And subsequently, D starts forwarding traffic to the pirate AS instead of A. So how do you prevent this? Origin validation. We want to validate, we want to be sure that the, the prefix announced came from the actual AS that owns that prefix, all right? How do you prevent that? There are two solutions. You have the internet routing registry and resource public key infrastructure. But before we move into the next section, let's have a quiz, a short quiz. Thank you. So you have a question? See only three people have joined.
So you have the question, the term in BGP given to an authorized advertisement of a prefix by an autonomous system is called what? AS spoofing, MAC address spoofing, card jacking, prefix hijack, or route leak? seconds. Whoa, there you okay. go. Eight people find found the right answer. All right, thank you for that. So Dev, over to you. Thank you a lot today. Let me share. Okay, so okay, I'm going to discuss about the second section, uh, why the IR alone is not sufficient. So what is the uh, IR or the Internet Routing uh, Registry? The IR is a distributed repository or a set of databases containing uh, routes and route re related information. It allows network operators to describe and query for a routing intent. So the IR is used as a verification mechanism of route or origination, and it is widely deployed to prevent accidental or intentional uh, routing incidents, such as prefix hijacks. The key um, objects used in IOR are routes and route six uh, objects, which describes from which AS number a prefix is intended to be originated. Next, we have the UTNAM object, which is the AS number, and it may be used uh, to, to, to also describe um, the routing policy of that particular AS number. We have also set objects such as AS sets, which are groups of AS numbers, okay, which can be referenced in many places where a single ASN can be referenced, but you can also use set objects there. And the last one we have here is the maintainer. The maintainer objects, uh, they are used to protect other objects in the IR database. So a maintainer object will usually have a password or a PGP key associated with it um, that, that is used to, uh, for authentication purposes. Here we have an example of an OTNUM object. So uh, an UTNAM object would provide the registration information on like who holds that AS number. And the holder of that, of that AS number can also describe the routing policy in the object. So here we have an example um, where MP export and MP import are being used to describe the routing policy. Uh, so, just for clarity, the MP here stands for multi-protocol. So you can use it to describe policies for both IPv4 and IPv6. And like the first line that we have here for the uh, pairing policy, uh, it simply says like, it, it defines the address family. So any dot unicast, so any here means any uh, IP protocol, so V4 and V6. Uh, 2 AS327992, that's the AS number of the peer. Announce any means that you want to announce all your routes to that particular peer. And the other example we have here is the MP import. So similar to the export uh, for both IPv4 and IPv6 from AS174, for example, you're accepting any, so any um, route advertisement from a AS174, you are accepting it. So this is just a, 
a few examples of how you can describe uh, the, the routing policy in an UTNUM, but you can do much more than that. Uh, it is quite complex and um, you can uh, describe or put in more information regarding your routing policy. Next, let's have a look at the route object. So here we have a route six object for IPv6. You can see the origin. So here the origin AS37301. So from this route object, we're saying that this AS number, it's supposed to announce this IP prefix, IPv6 prefix. And one thing to, to note that um, in, in root objects, root or root six objects, the prefix is always specified in the classless address uh, representation, so in, inside the format. And many ISPs use IR data to generate filters on their customer BGP sessions. So a lot of uh, ISPs would request their downstream customers to, to register uh, IR objects for their BGP announcement so that they are not, um, their, their announcement are not dropped or uh, the, the traffic is not affected uh, in, in, a, in a bad way. Next, let's, let's talk about the shortcomings of, of IRR. So, as you know, regional internet registries are the ones who distribute uh, IP resources, right? So regional internet registries have authoritative information on the legitimate holder of an internet number resource. So as such, the entries, the objects that are created in the IR database uh, that, are, that are managed by all IRs are authenticated. That is, there is a way that the legitimate holder can authenticate to create the objects, okay? But on, other, on the other hand, the other um, routing registries that are not managed by RIOs, they do not have a foolproof way to ensure that it is the legitimate holder of the address um, who, who is creating the object, right? And also, all registries uh, did not incorporate any checks to ensure that either the prefix or the AS number uh, that, that are being uh, specified in a root object, uh, they are in indeed uh, delegated by one of the RIOs. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why over time, um, this has created an, an expansive repository of obsolete data of uncertain validity that is spread across dozens of routing registry around the world. So just to remind you that there are, there are a lot of routing registries that are not managed by RIOs and are quite popular out there amongst uh, ISPs. The next um, problem with IRR is that it is resource um, extensive. Filtering based on very large number of prefix lists uh, can be very resource um, intensive on, on, the C, on the router CPU and memory usage. And the IR is based on our RPSL language. Okay, and, and the OPSL language and the supporting tools have proven to be complex, very complex to consistently transpose policy into a router configuration language. This resulted in most published OPSL data being neither sufficiently accurate and up to date for filtering purposes and no sufficiently comprehensive or precise for being like the golden master in the router configuration. So the IR, it, it is still widely used for filtering BGP announcements. So if you're planning on announcing a new prefix on BGP, one of the first steps is to create a matching 
a route object in the IRR. However, the, the, the main weakness of the IRR is that it lacks the authorization model across all the routing registries out there to, to make the system foolproof, right? Since it is difficult to determine what is legitimate, authentic data and what isn't. So this is the main reason why you shouldn't rely only on the IRR. Okay, in the, in the coming slides, uh, Ola Tunde will tell us how RPKI solves these problems. And, but before that, we have a short quiz for you. So please go to menti.com. Again, type in the, the code that you see on screen, or you can use the QR code to, to get the URL. Next question. What BGP operation is the MP export attribute in an autonomous object used to document within the IRR? Is it RPKI policies, BGP prefix hijacking, BGP sec, create route maps, or BGP route announcements? Okay, four people found the right answer or not. Thank you. Yes, it's BGP route announcements. If you looked at the autonomous object that Dev showed you guys, uh, you can see that uh, the MP export attribute was uh, announced to what you announced to your peers. It's like an ASC is your country, and you are trying to announce or export goods out. So uh, moving on, we are going to now look at how RPKI makes BGP more secure. Dev has already talked about how um, the IRR alone is not sufficient. You can see it's a bit complex to write your policies in the, the routing policy specification language. And um, uh, the, the filters you build for it. So uh, before we go into RPKI proper, uh, let us look at, we have to quickly take a crash course on PKI itself. Okay, so that we don't get lost because this is, after all, like I said, this is RPKI nuts and bolts. We're going to open the hood and we'll look at the different components of the uh, PKI and how they interact. So uh, PKI provides unique digital identities. So for example, the web server online, you, I mean, it's, uh, you can use PKI to provide a unique identity to that web server so that you know if you're trying to connect to that web server, you are actually connecting to that particular web server, not something else. Now, uh, it uses public key, uh, cryptography to achieve this. As you can see, you have both a private and public key pair, which is a, 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 this is a, what you call a asymmetric uh, encryption. So um, public keys, what are they used for? As it says there, you can use them if you want to connect to the server, for example, and you have the server's public key, because the server will have its private key, you can encrypt the information you're trying to send to the server with the public key. Also, if, uh, if uh, you receive a, a, a certificate or a document that's digitally signed, you can use the same public key to decrypt or find if, to find out who actually signed that digital certificate. Now, for private keys, you can use them to decrypt messages sent by a public key. Like I said, a server will have a private key to generate a public private key pair, and the public key is public. So the public key, you use it if you want to connect to the server to encrypt. And the server will use its private key to decrypt what you send to it. And then you can also use your private keys to sign uh, digital certificates. We won't go into details of signing, but just take note that you use your private keys to sign. To, you can also use it to sign. So let's just see, let's see how this works. So the web server that has the public private key pair generated wants to have a unique identity online. So what they do, they approach 
the certificate authority, this guy here. And a certificate authority, uh, usually, I mean, they, they, well, they are an authority in code. Let's say they, 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 they're trusted. They inspect, they see, okay, they check a few things and check you have you actually have the private key to the public key you're presenting. And then they issue a public key certificate, which they sign with their private key. Remember, private keys use them for signing. Now, a public key certificate holds, so here, as you can see here, the public key certificate for the server has the server's public key and that it has been signed by the uh, certificate authority, the CA. Now, let's say um, uh, cute Mary here wants to connect to the server and she wants to you know, send encrypt the message that she wants to send to the server. You can see that um, the server has this private key, as you can see there, here, sorry. And she's trying to connect to it. Now, she, all she needs to do is to have access to this public key certificate. Like I say, it's public. Anybody has access to it. But how does she know it actually belongs to the server? That public key is, is you know, it's a, it's a public key and it's the pair, corresponding pair to the private key of the server. Is because it has been signed by the CA. A CA is a trusted authority. Okay. Now, she will use, now, most browsers ship with what you call uh, the ship with what you call root certificates, which are basically certificates that contain the public keys of a CA. All right. So that's how Mary tries to connect to the server. She uses the public key, which she got from the public key certificate, which was verified because she knows that the CA signed it. And then she can uh, communicate. Now, this path to the CA. That chain, it's called a chain of trust. Actually, you know, ideally there, there are more than one CAs in between you and the relying party, which is this, the web browser, the relying party. Uh, but for simplicity, I've put just one here. So that chain of trust is very important. You trace, you trace that chain of trust back to the root certificate or the root CA to be able to attest that, okay, fine, this public key I'm using from the certificate actually belongs to whoever has that private key. Okay. So, Let's quickly quiz ourselves on that crash course before we move into our PKI. So next, next round of question. What two functions are public keys in the PKI used for? What two functions are public keys in the PKI used for? Mm. Encrypt information was the right answer. Yes, you <laughs> Okay, so you could choose two answers. So, okay, so yeah. So like I said, they have two, it has two functions. I can use it, either use it to encrypt, like I, when you're trying to connect to the server, or use it to decrypt digital signatures, like Mary used to decrypt the digital signature of the CA on the public key certificate. Okay, so let's get back. So now we, did, we just did a crash course on PKI, right? So now you now have resource public key infrastructure, right? So now RPKI is a cryptographic method of signing records that associate a BGP route announcement with the correct originating AS number. Now, two things to take out of that, Cryptogra uh, cryptographically signed. Basically what happens is that uh, a resource a resource holder, a resource uh, holder, address space holder, or an, an AS, like I used in the example before, will issue a certificate that is digitally signed, saying that we have authorized this AS to announce this prefix. 
All right, so Africa uses now in the previous graphic that we showed where Mary was trying to connect to the server, uh, the certificate, the public certificate is actually an X.509 digital certificate. And this is what RPKI uses also. But instead of using it to attest to identity, like the way the server is trying to say that the, I am the server, I am the, maybe I'm learnedafrenic.net, connect to me. This is used, this one is just typically used to show that this allo these resources have been allocated to me, to you, by this uh, RIR. And you can use this resource, I mean, and you, on this ASN, you can use to announce this prefix. Now this will, let's move, let's, let me show you an example. Oops. So now the RIR allocation scheme, if you're familiar with it, uh, we have, okay, there we go. That was the post there, sorry, on <laughs> the internet. So uh, the RIR allocation scheme follows the same I mean, the RPKI follows the uh, RRR allocation scheme. So you have where you have the RRRs at the top, normally, and then they issue or allocate resources to the, like in the LACNIC region and the APNIC regions, the Latin American and Asia Pacific regions, you, you have uh, national internet registries, and those also can sub-allocate to uh, ISPs or LIRs in the region. And then to, those ones can also sub-allocate to the smaller ISPs. Now in the RN, RIPE and African regions, we don't have the LIRs, but we have the LIRs and ISPs. Now this is the way resources, you know, the IP addresses blocks are sub-allocated, allocated down. Now the same thing, this is the way the, uh, the certificate uh, structure for RPKI is also issued. So you have the, the, the root certificate for the RIRs, and then you now have child certificates subsequently below, below NIR, LIR, ISP. So when, if you remember the, the graphic I showed you where the CA issued a certificate to this, for the server, that is a child certificate, okay? So when, the, when, the, when, the, when let's say LACNIC issues a resource to an NIR, they, will issue, they can also issue a resource certificate attesting that, okay, this resource has been allocated to this NIR and it's cryptographically signed, all right? So, now let's look at the components of RPKI to get a clearer picture. So um, the first one is the address space holder. Now the address space holder is, you know, some of you here are from universities, some of you are from ISPs. So basically an ISP or university, this is the limit, legitimate holder of an IP address space obtained from an IRR, all right? So, and you are the one who wants, you don't want your prefix hijacked, you want to, create, uh, you want to create a digital certificate that attests to the fact that you are the only one that can announce this prefix. This AS is the only one that can announce this prefix. So we have a resource certificate also, which was the first thing we talked about. So this is a digital certificate that attests that an internet number resource has been registered. Okay. So your when you, when you, when you, when you, as a, as a university or a bank or an ISP, when you approach a, an IRR like Afrenic and you, you, you request for internet number of resources, you also get a resource certificate for that. Okay. Now, this is a, this is a sample of a resource certificate from our, my Afrenic portal. You, know, you don't need to, to merge into it, but it will definitely have the issuer and the subject. So the issuer will be Afrinic, if it's from Afrinic, and the subject would be you, the ISP or the operator, and then to have the ASN and the rest, and it will be digitally signed. So the next uh, component in the uh, RPKI structure is the end entity certificate. Now, which is, now if you remember, I said the child, uh, when, when you sign a certificate, Another set with, with the root certificate signs another certificate. The other certificate is a child of the root certificate. So the end entity certificates are issued. It's basically it's used by an operator to delegate the authority that the resource certificate has to another certificate. Now, why is this? Now, if you want to, let's say you, when, when you sign when you sign a particular uh, when you sign a another certificate or you sign a document with uh, a resource uh, with a public key, if you want to revoke that, revoke that uh, uh, certificate, 
you need to revoke what signed it. Now, if you use your research certificate to sign any other thing you want to attest to within the RPKI, that means you have to revoke your research certificate. So this is why you have the EE certificate. It's easier to uh, revoke objects you sign within the RPKI. So it also looks, uh, has a structure like that, uh, where you have the, uh, the, 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 the resource and the, it's digitally signed. Now, the, the, the one which probably we're all looking for is the ROA, the Route Origin Authorization Object, which is also an object that is digitally signed. And basically this is what uh, a resource holder or a network operator is using to attest and state that this AS number is authorized to announce this prefix. Okay, now the, the ROA is kind of, it looks like this. You can see it has a, uh, the AS number, uh, sorry, my pen. The AS number and the prefixes, the IPv4 and IPv6 prefixes there. But it's kind of a souped up uh, uh, route object that Dev showed you earlier on. But the main difference is cryptographically signed and it has a max length. Okay, which we will see later on. All right, so the ROA is also stating here that we have an ASN and the prefix, and this, this are, so it's a AS prefix binding like a route object, but it's cryptographically signed. So the, um, the other uh, component here is the, in the RPKI is the trust anchor. Now the trust anchor is just like the root certificate, the root CA, remember the server operator had to approach the root uh the certificate authority now trust anchors are basically the rirs in the rri system remember the graphic i showed you earlier with the that starts from it from the rirs all the way child child certificates all the way to the isps so the trust anchor is the russier afrinic is the russier okay now if you want to connect to the trust anchor uh, you, yes, you connect with something, uh, it's called a trust anchor locator. All right, so now as you can see, the, you can see the graphic, I'm clear. So the trust anchor goes all the way down through your resource, the EE to the ROA, okay? That's the way, the, uh, the certificate of, tr I mean, the trust path, remember? Now, The next component is the repository. Now, remember the IRR also has a database, a database. Now the repository also is a database that contains a set of objects. We have certificates. Now we're not talking about CRLs uh, or manifests, but I've just mentioned them here because you find them in the, uh, in the, in the repository, this uh, certificate re revocation list as a CRLs and the manifest. And ROAS are all created and stored in the, in the, in the repositories. Now, now here, this is not a this is not a repository, mind you. This is what you call a, 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 a validator. But validators like this one here connect to repositories. So we have repositories, multiple repositories here. You can see the one for Afrin, for Arin, and the likes. And if you if you actually uh, look at the if you scan that QR code, you can actually get to this page, and you can see below that are other delegated repositories. So the next component we look at is the validator where a relying, uh, it's, it's just like the browser. Remember the browser, uh, uh, the browser software that Mary tried to use to connect to the, to the server. I mentioned that the browsers ship with uh, root certificates because how will you know, how will you be able to uh, start the chain of trust anyway, if you don't have the root certificates already. So uh, Africa validator is also there. They are like relying party software that, uh, that verify cryptographically signed objects, okay? And they, uh, and they also ship with, uh, well, we call them the trust anchors, basically, not the root certificate, which are the root in the RPKI structure. And they also what you call a, a VRP, a validated ROA payload. Now I have an example of one here from the uh, Routinator where you can see, uh, 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 these are, the, this are Afrinic's, uh, Afrinic itself, us here in the office, uh, our, our, prefixes and the payload here you can see is the ASN, the prefix, all the way to the trust anchor. 
which is Afrinic. They actually, uh, for that, they trust uh, anchor for that row is uh, Afrinic. Okay. So, of course, you need to access the um, you need to access the repository with some sort of protocol. All right. So, the protocol that will upload and download and change and or deleting. So you have rsync, which is a bit kind of getting deprecated, and then you have the uh, Africa repository delta protocol, which is RDP, uh, which is uh, which is used for fetching or pushing data to uh, the uh, repository. So you can also, if you want to see, because if you scan that QR code, you can see the two, uh, the part of a uh, validator that has the two different uh, connections to repository with the different protocols, the rsync and RRDP. Don't worry, these slides will be shared after the, the, the presentation. So the last component, I believe, is the uh, router to RPKI protocol, all right? So this is the protocol, uh, a border router running BGP, for example, we use to connect to an RPKI validator, all right? It, it's uh, it's, um, it's TCP-based, it's reliable, and uh, kind of smart enough where uh, the way it works when there's an update to the validator, for example, from the repository, it automatically updates the, uh, the, 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 the router itself. Now, routers can also connect to multiple validators. They don't have to be, you don't have to collect one. You have to have a redundant setup and it's not going to overload the router with uh, 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 validator router payloads from all over the place. It should be a union on all of them, basically. So before we look at how this works, let us quickly look at another quiz and see how we are here. So let's continue with what we have currently. Resource certificates can be used to authenticate the identity of an address space order. Is it true or false? Is it true that you can use resource certificate? 14 people. Yeah, that's true. Mm, no. I guess many people are following Ola. No, 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 no. Okay, hold on, hold on. Okay. Uh, actually, that is not true. Like, the mistake. So, resource certificates can be so they can, uh, No. So, uh, that is my bad. We need to fix that. So, no, you can't actually. It's uh, the resource certificate is not to attest to the identity of the resource holder. It's just to say that, okay, this resource has been allocated to. Uh, the, 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 the address space holder. That has nothing to do with the identity. Sorry about that. So I think we were at the uh, router RPK to RTR protocol. And we, oops. So let's look at how it works. Okay. Um, So the same, the same um, diagram we started with, we've added a few new actors to them. So you have the Paris Telecom and Senegal Telecom, and now Kenya Telecom in this setup. Now, the way it is, Kenya Telecom is um, going to be a relying party because they have the RPK validator. Remember, the validator is a relying party software, basically, right on the server. And the Senegal Telecom is an end entity who is trying to attest that we are the only ones who are allowed to announce that prefix, that green 2001 DBA face slash 48 from AS2, no, nowhere from, but AS2. So we want to, uh, so what you do, then we show you later on how to create a ROA. So Senegal Telecom has to create a ROA basically. And of course, you know, from, they have to get a risk 
when they get uh, resources from Afrinic, they get a resource certificate and they have to create EE certificates that will use to sign their ROAS. Now, the ROA will look some, you know, a bit colorful like this. So you have the ROA with the prefix, the, the origin is, the EE certificate that was used to sign it, the public part of it will be inside it, and the signature, which is the Senegalese flag here. And you publish that in the repository. Now, that's for Senegal Telecom. That's the end, and it does the uh, end entity. Now, Kenya Telecom, who is the reliant, who wants to, you know, be sure that whatever announcements they get is actually meant, is actually from the uh, AS that is meant to announce it. Because remember in the beginning of the webinar, there was a pirate AS that announced and they kind of got traffic redirected to them instead of to the actual AS that owned that prefix or was authorized to announce that prefix. So, um, the, the validator connects to the trust anchor. And I said, validators ship with trust anchor locators. T is called, called a TAL. Basically, it's a, it's a file that contains a URI to the, um, to the trust anchor. And the public key used to verify that's actually a trust anchor. Remember what the public key is used for. All right. You use it to decrypt, I mean, to encrypt, and also to verify digital signature. That's a decrypted digital signature. So the trust anchor will follow, you know, so they, 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 they pass down to your publication point or Seneg uh, Senegal Telecom's publication point and the repository and everything, you know, get, you know gets fetched to the Africa validator with RDP or RSync. So what happens next? Well, the validator, remember, outputs what you call a validated uh, ROA payload, that's a VRP, which I showed you an example of one from routing it or a JSON output. Where you have the ASN, the the you can see here you have the ASN, uh, the ASN, the the you know the prefix itself, the max length and the trust anchor is Afrinic. All right, and a collection of this because of course you won't have just one VRP in the whole world. Uh, a collection of this is called a, a validator cache. That's what the uh, validator outputs. Now, remember I mentioned the protocol between the, uh, the validator and the router itself, uh, the RPK RTR protocol, which is TCP based. So they, it sends, like I said, there's an interaction regularly with both of them. And the, BG, uh, the router builds what you call the BGP Africa table. Depends, you know, this varies, the name varies based on the vendor anyway. But basically, it's just a table the router builds from the VRP or the validator cache from the RPK, uh, uh, RPK validator, where you can see here you have the, um, the prefix itself, the max length, the origin, and the validator I got it from. Like I said, you can you are encouraged to to connect to more than one, make a redundant uh, have a redundant setup where you have more than one validator anyway. So you have all of that. But like I said, if you have the same prefix from uh, two different validators, it's not going to no, put two entries. It's going to be a union. Okay. So um, now let's look at route origin validation now, or ROV. Yeah. So now, with that said, if you, if you remember the last slide, we have a we already have a BGP API table. So now, uh, our Pirate Telecom, Senegal Telecom has announced the prefix. Sorry, uh, and Pirate Telecom has done the same up to no good again, doing their stuff, and. Based on that, oops, play my. Based on that, you have these two entries on the uh, autonomous system border router for Kenya Telecom there. So the the, the 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 green one, which is the actual owner of the the AS that's authorized to announce that prefix AS two, and the the AS that is not authorized to announce that prefix AS three in the red one. So we consult our you know, table again, but. Before we, you know, the, to, to, to help us make a decision or make the router take a decision, we have to go back to the drawing board. Now, when you, when you, when, uh, when, uh, when the router running BG, uh, route on BGP RPKI, or using RPKI, uh, gets a BGP route update, it can treat the updates in different ways. So it can be valid, meaning that prefix is covered by at least one validated ROA payload. Remember, the ROA contains uh, the AS uh, attestation that this 
ASN inside this ROA is authorized to announce this prefix and it's cryptographically signed. It has been signed, signed with an EE certificate. Remember that. So it's valid if one, if one of, at least one of the prefixes is covered by VRP. The other state we have is when you have a invalid where the prefix announced is from an unauthorized AS or a must be, uh, or a more specific announcement is made. So basically what that means is that in the AS path of the update, the, the AS that, start, that starts that AS path, the AS number that starts that AS path is not the one that is supposed to another prefix. And for this, for being more specific, meaning that maybe the, 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 the ROA and the prefix, the mean length of the prefix, they are the same, but the max length of the announced prefix is longer than the max length of the one in the ROA. So that would be invalid. And they're not found, not even covered by the VRP or partially covered. So either of those three. Now back to the, the to the to the scenario here, we have so we have the table. So what will happen is this will be valid because the VRP states that this prefix is with the prefix length 48, max length 48 is covered. So and the other one is invalid because the the originating AS is not two, it's three. And that's how uh, RPKI um, um, you know, helps with BGP uh, route origin validation. It's used for BGP route origin validation. So another quiz again, within that uh, quick crash course. <laughs> Let's go quickly to our last question. VRP contains what? Select one, one option here. What contains a validated router payload? Okay, voila. Are you okay with the, the answer? Hello, Ola. If you're talking, I think you're mute. My goodness, sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Let's go back then. So I was explaining the 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 um, the the answer to the quiz. Uh, that that the route origin authorization is the correct one. So and I said before we go into before Dev shows us how you create a uh, route origin authorization objects, raw objects in my uh, we will quickly look at the two implementation models of uh, RPKI. So there are two. Like I said, uh, the first one is um, hosted RPKI, uh, and the second one is delegated RPKI. Now, in the hosted uh, implementation, uh, the the the, all the objects, the ROAs, the, the manifests, the CRLs, whatever, e certificates, they're all published in repositories hosted by the RIR. Okay. Now, just like they will be creating using the Mafronic portal, you create your ROAs through a portal or some sort of API. And 
at the moment, this is the only implementation we have offered by Afrinic, the, uh, the hosted version. So remember these components, the same thing. So we have the address space holder there also. So everything is just hosted by the, uh, the RPKI service provider. And as you can see here, uh, Mary is connecting with the web browser or an API to the using the rsync or RDP protocol to the repository, which is she's not hosting. So basically, this is a this is a this is an advantage to it. It's very easy. You don't need to do anything other than to be a resource member and have uh, access to Mafrenic. It's very easy to do implement hosted RPKI with any of the RIRs. Um, it's also easy for you to you know learn the ropes and get operational experience before you go full blown with probably something like delegated or something. You can use it to test the waters. Now, uh, one maybe a bit of a maybe like I say, in the real current of a service, the service going down. This is not all. Well, no, this this is not probably about to happen, but it can happen. And then uh, concerns about the storage of the private keys. Now, remember what is the what is the private key used for? Yeah, use it to because when you when you when you remember the um, the the graphic I showed you about the web server, it had a public a public private key pair generator, but the private key being on the server. But with the hosted RPK, everything is hosted. It's all there on the uh, hosted RPK service providers uh, infrastructure, and probably there'll be some some people might have concerns with that, but it's not a big deal. Now for the delegated implementation, remember that graphic again about the, the way the RIRs allocate resources from the RRI to the NIR and subsequently to the IS, uh, LIRs and, and then the ISPs, the smaller ISPs. Uh, so you run your CA as a child of the, uh, of, the, of the RIR. So you have your own like root certificate basically in your own organization, but it has to be signed still by the trust anchor or the root certificate from your RIR. But, and then all your signed objects are, you know, you, 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 store, you keep them or you can contract a third party to do them for you if, you if you need that. So it's the same, looking at the graphic again, it's just like this. Basically you have all the resources, everything, you hosting them. Now, how will the validator be able to find you? Like I said, you are a child of the RIR, even though they're not hosting all your objects for you. So the validator, like I said, they ship with trust anchor locators. All they have to do is to connect to the trust anchor and they can find their way down to your own publication point in your repository. And uh, if you remember the graphic I showed you about Routinator, though the most the repositories is connected to where the RIR repositories. And like I said, if you scan the QR code and you scroll, Below you see repositories that are for delegated Africa implementations now that from RIRs. Then one other uh, another uh, positive or advantage to is that you have just a single point of administration. So you don't if you have a, as you can see here, Mary has uh, resources in different RIR regions. She just has she can manage all of that from one point. If you are using hosted RPKI. Uh, they will have to have uh, logins for different RIR portals to be able to, um, to manage those. And then you get to store your private key in this one. You're, after all, you're the one, you're, everything's delegated to you. Fine, even though you've, your, 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 child certif your certificate, which is a child, your root certificate, which is a child of the RIR Trans Anchor, uh, you know, is signed by the RRI, but you get to keep your own private keys, okay? Now, the only uh, downside to it probably, even though uh, the delegated RPK uh, software around are just mostly open source, but you still have labor and support contracts in case, in case you want to, like you say, outsource your repositories uh, and then equipment upgrades you might need. Okay, so how do you know what our, our RPK implementation is suitable for you? So for the hosting implementation, you're just a multi-home network operator either a small ISP or just an ISP or, or a bank or whatever, and you operate in a single RIR region, okay? So this is suited for you, all right? And for the delegated implementation, like I said, I showed you the graphic of Mary 
having resources in different RIR regions. This would be this would be an ideal candidate for having delegated RPKI. Might be a lot of work in the beginning, but it's 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 easier eventually. So when you you when you have when you are a multinational or whatever that's spread across different regions in the world, and you have resources in those regions, you might be looking into uh, you might have to look into uh, implementing delegated uh, implementation. Also, if you are you know you are an organizer. Uh, you, re you represent multiple organizations under a single IRR. You might have to look at that. Now, there are some other other uh, reasons. Probably uh, you you have uh, you're trying to use a uh, BGP automation, or you want to you want to have a uh, uh, implement uh, automated row creation and deletion or something like that. You might want to use uh, the uh, delegated RPKI also. So, without said, you have a quick quiz again. Uh, no, 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 sorry. <laughs> it was the one with the <laughs> Yeah, sorry, sorry. So uh, there we show you um, how to create a row on my Afrinic, your route origin authorization as a resource holder. Thank you, uh, Ola Tunde. So yes, before we before I show you uh, how to create a, a ROA on the Marfenic portal, note that at Afrenic, the ROAs can be managed by either an administrative or a technical contact who either has an, an Afrenic issued BPKI certificate installed or has two-factor authentication enabled on the Marfenic portal, right? So once the administrative or technical contact has logged in, like here, I have logged in on, um, on the Marfenic portal, uh, you should go under res resources and resource certification, right? So, here you'll find the options available to manage or PKI. So we have list certificates, as its name suggests, it will list um, the certificates and the IP resources that the certificate covers. Okay. Next, we have the view ROAs. So this will list all existing ROAs that has been created. We have the view old ROAs. So under this, you can see the ROAs that are no longer valid or that has been revoked. Issue ROA. So this is where we go to create a new ROA. Okay, and lastly, we have the refresh engine which is seldomly used. You can, you can use it, um, for example, when you have to create a ROA for a prefix that was issued a few minutes ago, for example, and you don't want to wait for the automatic refresh. So you can click on that refresh engine so that the OBK system picks up the new prefix that has been issued to you. So let's create a ROA. So we click on issue ROA. Right. So you will be presented with a form. Okay. You can, you, you need to input a name. So let me just put a name here. You need to select the AS number um, that will be originating the prefix. Or you can also type in another AS number, probably from another organization that will be originating the prefix, all right? Next, you can select the IPv4 prefix. You click on the plus button here. And 
So this is where you would specify the prefix that would be covered by this row. Okay. So here you have the network, then the prefix length. Okay. And this box here is for the max length. So the max length, this specifies the maximum length of the IP address prefix that the AS is authorized to advertise. So this gives the, the holder of the prefix control over the level of the aggregation that an AS is allowed to do. So for, for example, here, if uh, I set the max length to 23, this would mean that this AS can originate uh, one single slash 22 or the two adjacent slash 23 blo blocks. All right, so any more specific, for example, a slash 24 uh, that falls under this slash 22, uh, if a slash 24 is announced, uh, it, is, it will not be authorized by this row. All right. So, well, one important thing to, to bear in mind is that the ROAs should be as precise as possible, meaning they, they should match the exact prefix that you're announcing uh, in BGP. So, if you're not deaggregating anything, for example, you have a 22 and you're announcing a 22, make the max length the same. 22. So here we are allowing only this uh, slash 22. Uh, you can create a row for multiple prefixes. Even for multiple, uh, I mean, you can create for both IPv4 and IPv6 in a single row, but also multiple IPv4s and multiple IPv6. Right? Like here, I can select another one and add another prefix here. But, well, this is up to you how you want to manage the ROAs, but I would personally recommend you to create separate ROAs for, um, for different BGP announcement for ease of management. Okay, so here the max length, same thing as for the IPv4, uh, it works the same way. Now, we have here the valid before and valid after. We need to select dates here. Um, so you can set the valid before and after date and pass the date, pass the, the valid after date, the row will no longer be valid. Uh, the the Afrinic OPKI does not have an, an, an auto renewal feature. So here we would recommend you to set the validity for as long as you plan uh, on announcing uh, these prefixes. Okay, so for example, I choose the date of today and I'll make it valid for the next two years. So I simply click on add row. Okay, apparently this is an AS, uh, a name that has been used already. So let me just the name should be unique, okay? So it should be unique for its, its per account, right? So it's if a member has an existing um, ROA with the name, with, with a demo like we just seen, that particular member cannot create another ROA with the same name. But another member do not need to worry about it. They can, it can overlap with all the uh, uh, members ROA's name it is significant only in that in that member's account. Okay. So here the row has been created. Right. So you have successfully created the row. You can click on it to view what information is in there. So you can see the prefix, the IPv4, the IPv6, the AS number, 
right? And so you have successfully created the URL and it has already been pushed to the Afrinic repository. So this is basically how you create a URL. Quite simple, uh, doesn't take long, very easy to do. So that's it for me. Thank you. Um, back to you, Ola Tunde. Okay. So uh, you can see how easy it was to create um, your ROA in uh, or your ROAs in, uh, in the hosted RPK implementation like Afrinix. Uh, like I said, it's it's easy. It's you don't you have to next to nothing, and then it's easy for I mean use it to learn the ropes. So um, we will have a Q and A sec uh, session uh, uh, session now. If we have any questions, please. Now will be the time. I think Ola, you can start by responding or we can replay what people send in the Q&A. Uh, it was already answered. You can read the question and also the, the answer. Mm, let me see. Oh, let me, let me, okay, let okay. me, okay, there is one question. Let me start by the question we have. Do you have any guidelines on best practice for creating ROAS? Yeah, I think Willie, you, you can take that. <laughs> yes, yes, I was even, it's also the same question Patrick or Alan were asking. And um, usually I will recommend you one, one website, the RPKI documentation on some best practice where you can find, but basically uh, you have to follow, there is one RLC, the RLC 7115, where you have, let's say the, the best current practice regarding how to create and how, what you want to create. But the most important is to, for you to know that you should be conservative in the use of the max length in ROAS. Um, and uh, what I like is the liberal usage of max lanes open up to the network to a forged, forged origin attack. So the ROA should be as precise, precise as possible, meaning that they should match prefix announced in BGP. I think you and Dave mentioned that in your presentation. Okay. This is it. I will also give a link in the chat for that one. So we have next one. Best practices. Yes, you can take the you can you can read the question for the next one. Is there one the link for the meeting or no? <laughs> um let's help me function create the right now. How can we get slides now? Mm. Yeah, I think the two ones, the, the two of them based on asking about how to create and the, the best practices. So the one from Amos Yuda, I guess, is saying let's help the functional create the role. So I think uh, if you're a resource uh, member already, maybe the video, uh, the demo dev showed you should help you. Other than that, you can uh, uh, make a help desk request. Uh, for Andy Kawa, you're gonna get the slides, you're gonna get an email uh, after the webinar with the, with the, uh, with the uh, slides, presentation slides for you. So we have two more questions. So I think you can read the question from Aitam. Oh, let me read that one. Uh, Aitam is asking, what will happen if my peers don't verify the RPKI or don't use the RPKI RTR protocol? Will my routes and advertisement propagate or not? So he's asking if if his peers are uh, not verify RPKI or don't use the mechanism we were talking about. Uh, will his routes and advertisement propagate or not? Yes. And in fact, um, is it slum? Uh, sometimes. Um, 
it's uh, when you have when, okay so the, basically the way it's the, the order in which is it, it, the selection process for route origin validation valid yes that is is preferred then not found actually and uh, rather than uh invalid and if you have uh either not found or invalid routes you should still take uh necessary um steps also to review those further before you actually drop them because it's possible that you might um you might be filtering out genuine routes actually maybe somebody that's entirely created their road or put the wrong max length or whatever but for what he asked yes just take go uh yes and also want to add on what you just say is um as a resource owner uh, as much as possible we advise you to generate your own roas but you should never mind you should not be worried if people are not using are not validating uh, at least you have um, uh, many network operators who are already starting validating but for those who are not who are not yet validating it's not an issue as long as they can still receive your prefix. But of course, what can happen is they can also receive a fake announcement. But in any case, they will receive your route and advertisement. We have another question from Janine. Okay, let me read that question. Once your ROA expires in two years time or the date you set, you set, I'm assuming you should create new ROAs a few days before and revoke the old ROA. Yes, that's an overlapping one, yes. So, so you exactly, exactly, you want it to expire all the way to the end before uh, you create a new one, just like your banks will send you your credit card or before they, just about before the next one expires, the last one expires. So yeah, you don't want any breaks in between. Yes, that's right. And also you can have several certificates in the infrastructure. So you can have a new one, even though the, older, the oldest one is still uh, present. And actually it's the best way before you, your, prefix, your certificate uh, becomes invalid, Janine, what you can do is you can generate a new one with, um, a uh, longer date of in term of expiration. And then uh, the validator will consider the two and will just um, withdraw the, the oldest one when the time will come. So the next question from Bakari, we answered that during the presentation, but I'll, I'll read that, Ola. How can RPKI make BGP secure? It was at the start of your presentation, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know, maybe Edward wants to take the ones about the API or the auto re renewal because we don't, uh, Dev mentioned we don't have that yet. Remember, one from Patrick. Can you see those? Okay, don't worry, we can even answer even later on. It's not an issue. Okay, so I think Sarah is asking, what's, so far, what's the difference between eBGP, PGP, BGP, and PKI? <laughs> are you, are you, okay, uh, I'm, I'm reading the question from the Q&A. Ah. Okay, let me, let me read that one again uh, from Bakari. He was asking, how can our PKI make BGP secure? Yes, so yeah, it's that, that's, that was the main thing we were saying about route origin validation, ROV, where it's more secure, where you, uh, an autonomous system who has rightfully or has been allocated resources from an RIR gets issued a resource certificate, cryptographically signed, and they use that resource certificate to generate uh, their ROAS. ROAS are what they've just created now, which is an attestation, a statement that this AS number is authorized to announce this prefix. So when routers that run RPKI receive a prefix, they check it against their BGP RPKI table to see if there are ROAS that match that. If they don't, it's considered invalid. So in the case of prefix hijackings or you know, fat fingering, like you call it, 
those routes will not be accepted and you will not have the issue of you know black holing or diverting traffic to different areas. Okay, that is it. Uh, now we have a question from Amos. Well, we create the ROAS. Uh, quick answer, we create the ROAS. Um, there are two ways. We talk about the hosted mode and the delegated mode. But right now uh, for Africa, you create the ROAS the ROA within your account. Once you get the access, the approval, then you can create the ROAS from your account in my Africa. Let's get to the question from Janine. What monitoring system can you use to graph valid, invalid, not found? So for that one, um, I will provide one answer. Maybe my colleague will complete. Uh, when you are using us uh, with some validators, uh, act right now you have some features from those validators where you can see the, the prefix, uh, those who are valid, invalid, not found. Of course, once you connect also your eBGP, your router, your border router, or at least one router, when you connect it to your validator, once you get the, um, the RPKI table, you can also have some statistics. But let me just show you also with Routinator what you can see. Uh, when you are using Routinator, there is something you can see directly from the portal. Where you have this. I uh, will just show you the one from Afrin we have. I think you can see. Okay, this is for instance, routinator.afrinic.net. And with that one, you can have some metrics, data regarding what is happening under the, the scene regarding the prefix you get can get from any IRR, those who are valid, those who are invalid. And this is the live data that you can see. And this is the routinator we have here in Africa. You can all access to that one. But of course, uh, as a good practice, you can also install your own validator, this one in your own network. And that will be a good practice for you. So that is it for that question. I would, I would, I would like to add. There's also uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. They have a platform dedicated to RPKI. So it's it's statistics on RPKI from all the different RIRs. Um, yes. So you're accessing it. So, In the so meantime, you... another question from Alvin. Okay, let's let's just see. Okay, maybe Dave, you can just quickly comment on that one. Yes, so basically here you, you're seeing for all the RIOs at the top there, you can select for Afrinic, for example. You have in the black banner here, yeah? RIO, you see all, you can select uh, Afrinic. It will, it will give you stats for Af the Afrinic region. And it actually ref reflects the the current num percentage of members who are who are using RPKI, and you'd find the not found re representing those that are likely not using RPKI at the moment. Right. Okay. Let's go to the next question. Um, next question from Alvin. What if I announce the prefix of a customer? What if I announce the prefix of a customer? I think the, the next question completes it. The, uh, he's asking whether... The customer is responsible for the question of the ROA, right? Yes, so, so basically it is the holder of the prefix who, who needs to create the, the ROA. So if the customer has their own IP space from an RIO, 
So yes, they should be the one who creates the ruler. Now, if you are the one who sub-assigned uh, the prefixes to the to that particular customer, then it's up to you to create it. I hope it answers your question. Yeah, I hope. Yes, yes just add also, just to complete what Dev were just saying, uh, even if you don't have an ASN, but you have your own resource, your IP resource, uh, as long as your resource are announced by, let's say, your upstream, you can create your ROA, and then in your ROA, in terms of ASN, you will be adding the ASN of your upstream. But again, it's you as a resource owner who must create that certificate. You can't create a ROA if you don't have a resource certificate. Yes, it's not the upstream because it is not the resource owner. It's you as resource owner because it's the prefix assigned or allocated to you who can create that, that certificate. Okay, we have another question from Amos. This one is, I think it was explained the presentation. We, you get the presentation later on. You were asking if we can give the function of create the ROA. Uh, well, I think you explain all of them. Maybe you can just quickly summarize. Give the functions of creating a ROA. Can you explain? Or is it, is it asking about the, the demo that uh, Dave just showed us? Yes, I think it's just the it's the feature or the yes. Uh, but almost the most important is uh, once you get the presentation, you'll find the details in the presentation. Let's go to the question from Shaima. Uh, do you have a plan for the automatic renewal of the ROAS for Affinity? If we create the ROA for a prefix up to slash twenty three, I guess this is in IPv four. So I can comment and my colleague will complete if, if needed. Uh, we have several projects in the pipe we, and that the automatic renewal is one of them. Yes, and um, I think it's next question then, okay. Yes, okay, next question. Uh, if we create the ROA for a prefix up to slash 23 and another AS, not the origin AS of the prefix, advertise the specific subnet slash 24. Will it be considered as invalid or unknown? Well, if you remember in the presentation, there are two cases where you have invalid. Either the origin AS is not the right one that, I mean, the, the, the origin AS in the route uh, ROA is different from the one you get from the BGP announcement or the max length is longer than that specified in the ROA. So that would be invalid. So if, it's, if uh, you have a 23 there, for yours, it will be invalid. Yeah. Unknown means there's no record at all. Yes, yeah, so or not found. The right term is not found. Not found, yeah. Yes, I think the next question is more meant for Erin uh, because he's asking, uh, why doesn't Irene generate a ROA request generation or delegated API key pair for me? Mm -hmm. You should uh, send your question directly to Irene staff. I think it's better because uh, now how the way the each era is operating the API key process, it's up to them and their community. I think the second question is also in the same line. Mm -hmm. So that's all for the Q&A. I don't know, Ola, in the chat, maybe there were some questions. Mm, let's see. No open questions. You can start to share again the presentation. Um, no open questions. So, um, so right. Um, before we before we call it a you know before we close uh, the meeting we have another one um, oh there you go don't mind okay Amos is asking a reliable communication protocol used to receive validated RPKI prefix origin data from trusted cache 
question okay. is what happens if it's not a trusted cache? <laughs> Well, okay, there have been there have been discussions about because uh, uh was it Africa to router protocol is actually not encrypted. I think it's only one of the Cisco uh iOS XR, one of them that has that kind of encryption between the router and the validator. Uh but for now, uh it's it, it, it's kind of open. And like really said earlier on, we, we also recommend for you to generate, I mean to install, it's very easy routing it on your on your own network. <laughs> Yeah, I think okay. this is it. Um, okay, we are good in terms of QA. Okay. Um, so, oops. So, if you have more questions or you need some assistance, technical assistance with um, deploying RPKI or what, IPv6, whatever service, uh, you, you have the help desk uh, support. Uh, channel here for you. You can use the QR code. You can book a, you can book a slot if you want. Um, let me leave that for two minutes. Oh, no, sorry, <laughs> for a couple of seconds and then. Yeah, just, okay. Like you mentioned, it's free. Uh, you just have to have the short link here. You provide, you explain us your status and based on your inputs, we'll contact you and let you know how we can move forward with your challenge regarding RPKI. Okay. Um, we also have uh, e-courses on our Learn website where you can uh, learn, this, uh, I mean, learn more about these technologies at your own pace. Now, we are working hard behind the scenes to launch an RPKI course at the end of this year. We'll add that to that, we'll add that, to that list. Currently, we have seven in courses in English um three of them three out of those seven in french and one in arabic and we're working behind the scenes also to get all of them translated uh and then you know to other even other languages within the region so you can also check that out african academy we have our e-courses there and then this is our new initiative the uconnect program i don't know if there are universities in the chat here uh here we partner with universities uh to where your IT students, your computer science students can uh, take our e-learning courses to supplement whatever they have or whatever you have. Uh, it's, uh, we currently, we have about uh, 17 universities on the top of my head uh, from Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, and uh, Tanzania. So we'll be more than happy to help you with this uh, if you're so interested. And then uh, finally, we have the 36 program uh this is for um this is for uh the ipv6 certification so if you want to get a recognized ipv6 certification we have two tiers the silver and gold tiers uh please by all means scan this qr code uh and you find all the details you need there Ola, before we leave, uh, just mention that we have another question in the q and I will not read the whole question, but basically, Bakari is saying that the RIPE NCC validator has some issue. Uh, David Juki is, uh, is uh, answering, and okay. I will just say something uh, live. Um, RIPE NCC staff themselves say that uh, they, the tools have been deprecated, and they were recommending the community to use other validator. But I know that David will also respond in the chat regarding okay. that. That's very true, yes. So, any more questions? Yes, another one now. Is there a limit on the number of ROAS I can create? <laughs> Dev, do you want to say something on that? Um, well, technically, no. But mm -hmm. right, if you, it, as I mentioned uh, during the presentation, you should ensure that it, it matches exactly what you're announcing uh, on BGP, right? So if you have, I don't know, hundreds of, of prefixes that you're announcing, uh, different networks that you're announcing, you can have one row covering each of the BGP announcement. It's up to you. 
what is more easy for you, it's it's up to you how, how you want to manage it. But yes, you can create multiple um, ROAs to cover even the same prefix. And also we have a question in the chat. Um, I think this one is for you, Ola. In the e-course, can you cover RPKI for eBGP and iBGP, specifically for route reflectors? Okay. Um, no, not yet. I know what he means. No, we don't have the one for uh, for the, for the route reflectors, iBGP. So, but yes, we are working, you know, behind the scenes to update as soon as possible. Okay. Okay. Um... It's good to see that people have a lot of questions. Uh, it means that they were following. I think we are okay in terms of question. So that was, uh, so uh, from me and the and on behalf of the entire team who was in attendance today, uh, I want to thank you all for coming and uh, making this uh, and I hope you had fun. I had, uh, I had fun working on this. I hope you had fun also throughout the session. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, have a, we have another webinar on IPv6 transition techniques, if I'm correct, if I'm correct uh, in the next uh, two weeks, I think. Uh, so we'll be looking forward to seeing you guys here again. All right. So thank you very much and a very good evening from here in Mauritius.